Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel, um, which we're really excited about. Um, we're going to be exploring who gets to score music for film and how we can increase opportunities for more composers to break into this important form of music creation. I'm Vanessa Reed. I'm president and CEO of New Music USA. And for those of you who don't know us, we're a national resource which supports the creation, performance and appreciation of new music for adventurous listeners. We provide funding through grants and targeted programs whilst connecting music creators, organisations and audiences through our online magazine and our work as advocate for the field. Today's panel about writing music for film is part of uh, New York Mayor's extended play programme, um, which, which stems from the New York Music Month, which happens every year. And I'm really um, honoured to be presenting this in collaboration with them, um, the Mayor's Office for Media and Entertainment. And we're going to hear from Shira Gans, who helped make this happen in a moment. Um, before we do that, I just want to tell you a bit about where this uh, panel discussion idea came from. It's inspired by our work with composer Christoph Beck and music company CSAC on the Real Change Fund for Diversity in Film Scoring. And that's just one of the programmes that New Music USA runs in response to the inequities that we want to address in our music industry. Today's event also demonstrates New, new Music USA's commitment to new music in all of its forms and our aim to demonstrate the many career paths it's possible to take as a music creator, regardless of your background or starting point. And I know that many of you here who are watching today are composers. So we're looking forward to hearing your questions and talking about how um, this industry works. I'm joined by two brilliant composers uh, who are also on our advisory council at New Music USA. That's Nico Mooley, who's written many works for the concert stage, opera and ballet, as well as for film and TV. And Tamar Kali, who is a singer, songwriter, composer and artist who has defied music genre boundaries to craft her own unique alternative sound. Nico's film and TV scores include The Reader and BBC drama Howard's End. Tamar Kali's scores include Mudbound, Shirley and The Assistant. And I'm also delighted to welcome Erin Collins, who's Vice President of Film, Television and De Developing Media for CSAC. And she's also an advisory board member for the Real Change Fund I mentioned earlier. So these are the people you're going to hear from. But before we jump into our discussion, I want to hand over to Shira Gans just so that she can tell us a little bit about this brilliant program of events that have been happening online, thanks to the Mayor's Office. Thank you, Vanessa. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone tonight. Um, it's quite moving to see in the chat people from all over the country and the world. So welcome. It's, it's exciting to um, curate a program that historically has been geolocated very um, locally in New York City and to see in this moment, despite the constraints that it's reaching beyond those borders. So historically, New York Music Month is an event that happens every June here in New York since 2017. It's a program that I launched for the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. And it's grown every year. Uh, unfortunately, last year we had to pause the programming due to the pandemic, but this year we launched it as New York Music Month Extended Play, and it's been going since January and it'll run all the way through June. There's free resources for artists, there's programming for fans, there's New York Music Month talks, which really delve into different topics that are relevant to folks across the industry. And shortly, we're also going to be launching a youth programming vertical. So I'm going to put it in the chat, the website, uh, every event that happens, if, you're, if you aren't able to tune in live, the video is up within a few days. So I hope that everybody from around the world, you can tell your friends, everything's available to everyone for free. And I hope you enjoy the discussion tonight. I'm excited to hear about this. And I'm going to put it in the website, I mean, in the chat, and I'm going to hand it off to Vanessa's very capable hands. Okay, enjoy the program tonight. Thank you, Shira. So please, everyone who's watching, do be preparing questions. We're going to be making sure that we've got at least 20 minutes at the end to take your questions. So we'll be collecting those in the chat. Uh, but before we do that, let's just start by hearing uh, some of Nico and Tamar Kali's stories about their journey into film music. Um, and some of the music you've written, Nico, let's start with you and, and how that came about. 
Sure. So I, I have a very um, I have a very lucky pathway into film music. I uh, worked for a long time as a kind of editor and factotum uh, for Philip Glass in his studio. And one of the sort of interesting things about Philip's relationship with films is that he's done a bunch of them, but he kind of dips in and out of that world. So it's not the, it's not the only thing that he's doing. And I think, you know, it, it's it's a nice thing to do if you find the right collaborators, it keeps the lights on, you know, but the, he was always kind of one, one foot in, one foot out. Um, and so having had that experience, I felt sort of ready to, to have simultaneous paths as a concert music composer and, and a film composer. And I was just incredibly lucky to have been asked to um, to score things early on. But I also have the the um, deep, <laughs> the, the big disadvantage of not being a good sort of stylistic mimic. And I find it very hard to write music that doesn't sound like the music that I write um, nor normally. Uh, so it's it was an easy path in one way, and then it was a very difficult one um, in another way, and something that I'm, I'm still wrestling with. So you're kind of saying that the the entry point and the the useful uh, people that you were working with gave you that access, but then artistically, it's something that's been more challenging for you. Correct. Yeah, and I think it's it's a form of collaboration that's many clicks um, past sort of more equal footed collaborations as one might have with a with a choreographer or even with you know someone that you're working with as an arranger. It's a very different thing. Uh, we can talk about this more later, but but sometimes what the ask is is very specific, um, and yeah. Well, let's let, uh, let let let's ask Tamar her her journey, and then we can kind of we can kind of circle back to, to come Tamar. back. Yeah, sure. Because I want to hear about some of the films you've written for. But Tamar Carly, so at what point in your very kind of wide reaching career did you um, get that opportunity to write for film? How did that come about? Well, um, I really fell into it. It, it. it was totally a surprise. Um, I started developing a friendship with the director, Dee Rees. Um, initially, I had lent some songs to her debut feature film, Pariah, um, for the soundtrack and as diegetic music. And then I ended up doing a cameo in the film. And so through us being connected in this way initially, we became more familiar with each other, each other's work. And so when she discovered that I had a range of projects from um, you know, aggressive melodic rock all the way through to experimental classical, and she became more familiar with my chamber ensemble, she informed me that she wanted to work with me in this way. And I wasn't clear that she meant scoring at first because she initially mentioned it when she was doing the biopic for Bessie Smith. So I thought it was just around you know, like a historical kind of like that type of consideration. Um, and then when my band came, she's like, yeah, I want you to score it. And she made sure because of the experiences we had with um, Bessie, because I didn't have a reel and I hadn't been composing for film. Um, and actually, uh, Rachel Portman did that when Emmy, so it was an amazing choice. Um, so she made sure that she was in a position that she could choose the artist she wanted to collaborate on the score. And she had decided that that was me. And, and so it was a really wonderful opportunity where I had an artist that stood up for their desire to collaborate with another artist and made sure that it happened. And from there, um, I scored a, a film with Josh Marston come Sunday and it's been growing since then. But I too like Nico want, you know, for me, this is, something that's in my arsenal as a musician. It's just another stream of expression. Um, so in addition to performing, um, I'm composing for film now too. And But the thing about composing for film, for me, what it does is, whereas in my solo projects, I'm wearing so many hats, um, collaborating with, it gives me the opportunity to collaborate across disciplines with people and to be able to focus on like one singular aspect of my artistry, which is great, which can be a rest in between the solo projects where there are so many more aspects that you're dealing with. So I, I really enjoy mixing it up. I love this story, the idea of you kind of starting as an artist and actually performing on someone's film and then kind of moving to the other side and writing the score for the next one. Um, Erin, you work with all kinds of different composers at CSAC. Is this 
a route that you've heard about through, from other composers or what are the most kind of typical routes into film music that you come across? Oh, you're muted, Erin. Sorry. <laughs> As you've heard so far, um, everybody's story is different. And um, weirdly, a lot of composers in media have come from bands, um, whether they played professionally or just had a band in high school. It seems to be a common thread through almost every composer I've met. Um, now, a lot of people um, decide to get in through the assistant route. And that would be them approaching a composer and offering to do not necessarily writing right away, but other tasks that they're that a composer isn't interested in doing, like printing stems or uh, organizing sample libraries or uh, wrapping wires in the studio and you know things like that. Um, so that's one route. Another is the school route where people study film scoring in schools. And there's some wonderful programs in New York and Boston and Chicago and LA. Um, and those programs frequently have a really strong alumni network. So um, I know composers will call you know, one of the alumni networks and say, hey, who do you have in town who writes like this? You know, um, So some people get recommended that way. Um, and another way is people who are just starting out, starting with really small projects like um, student films, they'll score for free. Um, I know people who have gotten their start finding films on Craigslist of all pages, <laughs> you know, and they choose projects not because they're going to make any money, but because of the exposure they'll get eventually or the relationships, more importantly, that they make with uh, up and coming directors. And then you know, hopefully they can ride those coattails through the success of the director or the cinematographer or whoever they happen to be working with. Great, so clearly there are lots of different routes into this world. Um, and I know that, I think I've read an interview with you, Erin, actually, that talks about how you feel that the industry is becoming more open in terms of music genre and where it mm -hmm. sources artists. Do you wanna say a bit more about that? Sure. Um, you know, traditional film and net, I mean, films and like studio films and network television is, um, it can be, at least in the past, pretty generic. Um, there's a handful of voices you hear and it's all kind of the same. Um, and I think that lately people have been a little bit more experimental, especially in the world of streaming. Uh, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon have been uh, developing wonderful programs and they're more likely to take a risk on an up and coming writer or someone that only has a little bit of experience. Um, and I'm really excited about the world of games. Video games have all kinds of different soundtracks going on and they seem to be really interested in taking um, a broad approach to styles and experimenting and um, I, I like the game industry a lot because everyone's super excited to be there and there's not a lot of notes. It's mostly like, wow, this music's great, you know? So it's very uh, positive in some ways and, not, and negative in others that, you know, it's tough on women and um, in that industry. But um, overall, I think that there's a lot of new and exciting music coming out of media these days. Brilliant. I want to come back to that point about obstacles for women and other underrepresented voices later. But before we do that, part of today's discussion is really about kind of inspiring people with stories about composers who are succeeding with music and films. So um, Tamar Kali, what's been, if you had to pick one highlight from your experience so far, um, which one would that be? Interesting. Um, of course, the first, you know, um, the first time is, is, is for me was extremely exciting. I mean, it was, there was so much for me to learn, but what I was able to create and what came out of me, I was extremely proud of. Um, Shirley was a great experience because I really got to use my voice. It was the first score that I definitely used my voice on. Like, you know, it was like very minimal and down, but, and tap into like some of my choral classical training and just 
it, w it was such a release that was exciting. And I know that the majority of the projects that I do for film, it's not gonna be that type of scenario where you have um, a collaborator who's asking you to give them more of you and to just really swing for the fences. Um, so that definitely stood out. And then I would have to say, scoring the documentary um, um, for John Lewis, it was, I just, I felt a debt in a way to him for, and, and the movement and to be able to put that respect, deference and love into the project was a very unique experience. And I know that that, you know, that's not gonna be the standard. So I feel very lucky to have had that experience. Sure, and the incredible um, Shirley film came out during lockdown, didn't it? Or just before, perhaps? During, during, in the thick. It came out in June of 2020. Yeah, so that must have been a very different experience from usual. I mean, what? how did you go about the kind of business side of promoting that film during a global pandemic? Well, Neon was promoting it. You know, I was here in my house, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's so interesting because I live a pretty much very solitary, isolated existence. And I've, you know, in these more recent years and with the advent of COVID, um, I've really leaned into the composition part of my expression. So that's mostly me in a room creating. And then the after effects. So it's like I'm one member of a team and there's a whole vision and a whole protocol that exists above and beyond me um, when it comes to film. So I essentially do my part. And then when it comes out, I might participate in certain um, aspects of the promotional uh, plan. But for the most part, I'm probably working on something. And I'm sure it's like this even for, for, for sometimes for actors, you know, um, so we're kind of like doing the next thing or whatever, but it was exciting to, to, to be in conversation with Josephine or to be on panels and talk about it. I mean, I think by June, people already had a rhythm in terms of the virtual vibration. You know, if it were perhaps March of 2020, that would have been probably exceptionally different. So it was just a matter of not being physically present, but there was a lot of virtual, uh, you know, events. There were a lot of virtual events. Sure, and for anyone watching this webinar who hasn't seen Shirley and heard Tamar Kali's score to that, please go and seek it out. It's my favorite score from the past like five years. So congratulations on that. Um, and Nico, tell us about your highlights. Like if you were to pick out one moment in your career of writing for film, like what, what was the most satisfying? Um, I'm actually gonna give you two, uh, two but briefly, cause they're the same, but, but the opposite. Um, so, and it's almost exactly what Tamar said. It's it's it all has to do with when they're asking for you or more of you or how much of you. Um, so last year I scored this Japanese film um, called Gift of Fire, which takes place uh, in the few days between or sort of in the few days leading up to um, uh, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki in in Japan. I was the only non-Japanese person involved in in the film. It was all entirely in Japanese, and the only reason I, I they asked they hired me because the director was like obsessed with all this random music of mine like it wasn't and he didn't he didn't have any of the film scores it was all like chamber music he found on YouTube and strange little things and that was one of those examples again of being in an ecosystem where he really wanted me to do my thing at and around and in conversation with and in sort of caucusing with the, the very poetic and beautiful thing that he had made and that's such an honor as a musician to when so when when you're in what can sometimes be a very like top-down um, collaborative environment. But then on the other side of that, a, a highlight was when I battled my way through, it was a very complicated notes process on this um, BBC adaptation of Howard's End. And the BBC, they, they don't realize this, but they want everything that takes place in, that, in the past to sound like Downton Abbey. And they'll, they'll give you notes that they're like, we don't want this to sound like Downton Abbey. And then they tell you exactly how the Downton Abbey theme goes <laughs> for like 45 minutes and like in different ways. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's literally, it's like the most fabulously like off thing. Um, and so that was one of these things where I was in this like time crunch, you know, cage fight with one of these producers. And we somehow negotiated it such that 
that she was under the impression that she was getting what she wanted that wasn't Downton Abbey. And I was writing music that felt true to myself. And it was like this confrontation that resulted in actually me like extending myself in a way that I had, didn't think that I was going to. And that sounds like an insane and crazy and thing to say, but the conflict between you're asking for something that isn't on the menu here and, and me kind of learning to compromise with that situation and, and producing something I was actually really proud of was kind of life-changing. So I, I, I secretly, <laughs> I mean, you know, it also took 10 years off my life or whatever, but. <laughs> so you basically managed to get through one of the challenges that really troubles you the most in this kind of area, which is that, yeah, making sure you're not compromising beyond where you want to go with your, with your art. It's a, it's a funny thing. I mean, I mean, Tamara, I, I, I don't know if you, you've dealt with this. I'm sure, I'm sure you have. That, that sometimes you really do feel like in the middle of these projects, like, why did you call me if this is what you want? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Where I'm like, you are asking for, like you're at, you're that weird person at the steakhouse ordering the fish. Like, like this is like not, <laughs> so, and, and, and you do have to kind of, kind of, you, you have to learn how to push through that moment. Um, and it's such a relief to hear you talk about the benefit of being able to find the happy medium and split the difference, right? Because it's almost like this code that you have to crack because everyone's interpreting and understanding music in their own way. Mm -hmm. And particularly if people don't practice music, you've got to kind of figure out what it is that they're asking, you know what I mean? And it's like, cause I love to deal in more like impressionistic or esoteric concepts, but sometimes people get really specific in ways that might lead you down the wrong road if you're not able to interpret what it is that they're connecting to in that music. So it's more about hearing what they're talking about and figuring out what it is about that technique or music that's they're responding to, as opposed to, oh, I heard a, a, someone gave me a great tip. It says, you take the note, not the solution. Yes, right. That's so, that's the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, write that down. <laughs> I, always, I also feel like, I mean, I, something I, I wish that we as composers could, could do is force people who make films, like producers, directors, anyone, to listen to a MIDI demo of something they love. Like, what is like the trashiest MIDI demo of a great <laughs> score and make them listen you know like someone should make like a like a general midi like sibelius ads like note performer as version of jaws and then see and then just and be like this because yeah. it, and it comes down to language of like you know we can speak this code with each other and you could send me a score and i know how it sounds and whatever but you know they're in the totally different world and then don't necessarily always have the have the literal words to describe you know, so it, it, it so so often that you're you're in this kind of interpreter mode, and even if you have the best music editor in the world, there's still this kind of UN translation headphone journey that you're on <laughs> that has its own its own flaws. So I want to really to, to right. Ali, I just want to continue with this theme of codes for a moment because we're kind of at the moment talking about yeah how to get through all of these different moments, kind of complex moments when you're in the industry. Um, but if we take one step back, I think there's also a perception from the outside that there must be kind of magic codes to actually get in there. So I wanted to bring Erin into the conversation just to talk a bit about the Real Change Fund, because the fact that surrounds that is that only 4% uh, of the composers who wrote the scores for the top uh, 250 films last year were women, for example. So there is some kind of mystery just surrounding the entire industry because of who's not represented. So can you tell us a bit about why that fund has been set up and what it's seeking out to do? Sure, um, as we all know, the majority of films and, and television shows for that most part are scored by white men. And that's not to bash white men, we need them as allies. Um, it's just a fact. And so we saw a need to create a program that would allow diverse voices to be heard. Um, and so we decided to create a grant program for writers who are at the glass ceiling 
Um, they have experience. They just need like one great score to break through. And we provide funding for that score uh, in, in terms of uh, hiring musicians or maybe you need an engineer or a great editor. Um, so we, we provide assets for that in addition to mentoring from our advisory board. So uh, we have some wonderful people on there, Christoph Beck, Pinar Toprak, Miriam Cutler, a lot of people with a lot of experience. So they'll jump in and help walk somebody through the progress, the, the process of scoring, um, you know, really special project. Um, so um, we've been going, this has been a project we have had in the works for a while, and we were very fortunate to find New Music USA to be a partner with us, um, and they provide structure and, um, you know, keep us all on task, <laughs> and it's, it's been a really wonderful experience. So far, we've had three um, grant recipients since we started um, really pushing for it this year, um, all women we're excited to say, and we have more in the works. So, um, so far it's been really exciting, but we need more people to spread the word that we're looking for those, you know, um, kind of mid-level composers who are looking for uh, a chance to produce a, a better score. Sure, and Tamar Kali, um, are there any other forms of support apart from this example of obviously that's financial support, but if you were um, advising us or any other body in the music industry about what we should be trying to provide to composers who aren't yet properly in the industry, what would that support look like or what could be done, do you think? I think it's the positioning of how we frame some of these conversations that might uh, that, that's important and can bring about more effective change um, in terms of not isolating this issue as though it's not in every aspect of our society and being. Because one challenge that I see sometimes and how it ends up becoming a numbers game or people get caught up um, and toes are stepped on is um, when we're not recognizing that a lot of times the structures that we are seated in when we're trying to discuss more opportunity, more equitable opportunity are actually inequitable hierarchical systems to begin with. So if that's the foundation and that's the playing field that you're trying to do this work in, it's going to be a challenge. So we kind of have to take a step back, you know, gender, race, those are, are pieces of the puzzle. Um, equity will cover us all. So we have to look at different modes within um, the structure altogether. Um, things like, you know, an expectation for the artist to make themselves desirable for a project by falling on their sword, by not having the resources they need economically, or, um, you know, uh, outsourcing um, and, you know, exploitative hiring practices and, and how sometimes people approach outsourcing. These are all things that we need to consider. So if that's the body that you're dealing in and then you're trying to talk about race or gender, like there's only so far we can go if we're still working within like this hierarchical inequitable system. We just have to understand that it's all related. That That's something that I see that can often be an obstacle. Um, and so while intentions might be good, we're not always as effective because we're not dealing with the issue as a whole on a holistic level. Sure. And in, in terms of, you know, some of the really influential and important aspects of your career um, that you've taken charge of, if you like, um, relationships are obviously very key. And you've had one very strong relationship with one film director, Dee Reese, um, who you've worked with on multiple occasions. Obviously, you had very positive relationship actually with another female director for, um, for Shirley. Um, so is it a coincidence that those two directors happen to be women or has that been a an important part of the kind of success of, of those collaborations? Um, I think that it's not a coincidence and working with Kitty as well. Um, I think that because of how, when you're in an industry that is not very reflective of your personhood or your experience. You know, you have the experience of being singular in that way. 
And so if you see a like-minded person, they might sit, share your same gender identity that, and they're doing things that you can relate to or you, you feel like, you know, for me with D, like she was so strong and a trailblazer in terms of how she wears her authenticity and she brings it to bear and how she functions in the industry. You know, that's why she stood up for me as a, a composer that she knew who had no real, who hadn't um, written for film before. And she was like, this is who I want. So in her action in that regard, she was very strong. And I guess you could take that as a political stance because that's not the norm, you know? Um, so to be able to fight for people's work to be heard, to be seen. Um, and I think that that attracts certain types of people to you. So, you know, it makes, you know, so I feel like maybe with Josephine and certainly with Kitty for the assistant. Um, but I've recently worked with Fisher Stevens on the film Palmer, which was great. And I was referred through Joshua Marston, who I work with. So, you know, it's like, definitely about relationships and artists to artists. Like if you're able to come together and make something you're both proud of, the word will spread. Um, I think that directors, I think, but it's, but that's an individual thing, you know, and we all have our taste as individual artists. I think that the stuff that um, Real Change is trying to address is um, structural. So, you know, it's like these two different spaces because as an artist, it's like, I'm drawn to who I'm, in, I'm drawn to, I'm inspired by who I'm inspired to. I certainly can take on the task as an individual to be more mindful of what the landscape is that I'm looking at. If it's, if it's very homogenous and if I might be missing out on opportunities, like I, I can take that on as an individual. Um, but then there's this separate story about structures and how they're hierarchical and usually you know, we're, we're gonna see a lot less people of color, a lot less women in a lot of these industries. So I think it's, it's, it's twofold. There's like a personal thing, but that, you know, you can't police hearts and minds, but we can certainly address um, structural things in an industry and how people are operating on that professional corporation level. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I think it, there are multiple levels where all of these questions need to be addressed. And as you say, some are personal, some are structural, some are financial, I think, and giving, uh, trying to create a more level playing field. But also, I think we should probably talk a bit about education. And Nico, you know, you've had quite a bit of experience working with younger people and also thinking about how younger composers can access your world. I mean, what advice would you give to a composer who was trying to break into this world of writing for film? What, what first steps could they be? taking so i mean i <clears throat> i feel like i'm not necessarily the, be the best person to ask about this just because again my own journey was so sort of crab wise into it but i will say that um i think there's sort of two paths of of possible uh, interest and i think um the sort of more vulgar and really practical path is figure out what actual literal stuff you need and figure out what kind of space you need to be in, whether or not it's like a little desk in your house, figure out what you think you need in order to, to sell your work in the kind of bizarre embryonic stage that we that we exist in for so long. And whether or not that's, I don't, I don't think you should be, feel tricked into buying some $9,000 sample library if it's not gonna be something that you use. I don't think you should feel tricked to use one piece of software or another if you are fluent in one. Like I, I think there's a kind of, there are things that you need that you'll probably need to kind of up your game. And then there are things that you really don't and that, that'll be kind of peer pressure. So you just have like an honest conversation about that, which will immediately open up a kind of financial conversation, which, you know, can we can address in a different way. And then the other thing is, and something that I, I never quite know what to do with is occasionally on, online, younger composers will send me their like film reel. And it is like this, basically the titles of the cues are theoretical places in which it might be used, right? Where it's like sci-fi theme or like romantic music. And I, I wonder, um, and this is more of an, inter an interrogation of this more than like a specific piece of advice, but what, what that ends up doing to me doesn't feel like the level of kind of basic technique that will make your music shine. It feels like you're starting with some, you're starting with something kind of two levels up from the from the re, from the actual craft of the thing, and and you're starting with style as, as as opposed to like knowing how to chop an onion or something like the really basic things that make you 
the artist that that you are. Um, and I think that the I I would hope that if you made a real or just a CD of kind of things that things that represent you, maybe half of it can be sort of specific, like put this in your put this in your sci-fi theme or whatever. But then the other half should be things that that you really, really, really honestly believe in. And trust that there are smart people out there who won't need to be told where to put the brilliant thing that, that you made is. And I feel like that's something that's really important, especially if you think about 10 movies that you've loved and you go through the score and you think about sometimes the most spectacular moments are not ones that would have appeared on such a compilation, right? Sometimes the most spectacular thing that happens in a film is, um, you know, the simplest thing, like the most horrifying things that happen in Rosemary's Baby, it's like a note, you know what I mean? And so it's not like horror, horror music for devil baby kind of generic thing with sort of, you know, ag aggressive Silpanticello like George Crumb strings or something, you know, they're, so it, it, it's really about like figure, figuring out a, a, a path that's the honest path and then a path that, path that shows your technique as well. Um, yeah. And then also just the money, the money thing with sample libraries and all that stuff is, is confuses me um, because that goes back to what I was saying before about like these kind of MIDI, MIDI imagination. Like it just for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, it's like if you're making demos for a film, there's this expectation that it has to sound almost as good as real instruments. Inevitably, what happens is that because these sample libraries are so lovingly recorded and so expertly dealt with that they will inevitably sound way more expensive and like way more strings than whatever crazy budget it is that you're being asked to record with, right? Like the sample library will have cost eight times more. The sample library just for a flute will cost eight times more than the entire music budget for a film. Like, so, so you're kind of up against this really chaotic situation where you've been asked to spend a jillion dollars on this stupid thing. And then, you know, <laughs> and then everyone's like, well, why doesn't it sound as good as the, the you know, the flute that was recorded with like, you know, the forbidden microphone that only two people have ever touched like in Abbey Road or something. So, I, you know, it's, it's really about figuring out what of that stuff you're willing to participate in. And, and again, figure, like figure out what you need and don't feel like you need to kind of immediately spend, you know, $65,000 on a bunch of stuff you won't use. Sure, that sounds like useful advice. Tamar Carly, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, you know, because it goes back to what I was going to say earlier that, you know, I think that the key components of a relationship when you're writing for film with the director is to have this foundation of trust and imagination. You know, it's like, and because for me, I, you, you know, Nico and I are on the same page that I'm not interested in um, a digital product that's supposed to mimic real life playing. I'm just trying to give you a framework of what we're trying to do, give you a facsimile. And then the goal is to have it played by human beings and to have it be this, you know, inspired, beautiful, organic piece. And I think that that expectation of the industry can be a, a bit of an obstacle if you're that type of composer, you know? Um, I'm not a gearhead. Like I write from the heart and I, I need that thread of trust you know, like that's the foundation we need to be working on so that you know what my work sounds like, you know what I'm hinting at, and then we record it and that's our moment. Sure, Erin, do you recognize some of these points and are there any other kind of tips or advice that you find yourself regularly giving to the composers you work with? Sure, um, of course, everyone talks about this all the time. And there's a couple, things people do they'll um there are free sample libraries available that may or may not have good quality stuff you have to kind of dig around um and then there's some people have to learn to specifically write for the samples they have so for instance if they want you know solo trumpet you know tough to find an inexpensive sample of that but for you know a few hundred dollars if that, you can hire a trumpet player to do what you need him to do. So um, I think a, a, an understanding of, you know, in a, a creativity of dealing with what you have, understanding what you have and creating scores that may not be 
you know, exactly what you had in mind. If you have a John Williams big score in your head and you don't have those kind of resources, you know, what else can you do to create that feeling rather than investing in, you know, a, you know, hundred thousand dollars orchestra session or that much in sample libraries. Can I, can I add to that? that? That's such a, that's such a wonderful thing. And, and yes, and there are so many, um, wonderful libraries. I mean, I think, you know, I love the people at Spitfire, like that stuff is really good, but their free stuff is even better in a weird way. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, <laughs> um, no, not even, but, but we love them. And um, one of the things that I think Corona has done that this, you know, this horrifying hellhole that we're living through is that um, more and more musicians have pretty good home setups. And more and more musicians are very happy to work with you. And you say, look, like I need, I need to just demo out this like random viola part. Like, do you mind for you know a hundred bucks or whatever? Like, just, just. And this is something you know, and you should meet these people. Like, you, if you, if you are a composer, you should be friends with musicians who, who are willing to kind of be in your ecosystem in that way. But the other thing is, be friends with other composers. Um, and don't think about them as competition necessarily. Like the number, like so many people call me up, they're like, hey, we know you have nice sample libraries. Do you mind helping me out with a demo? I've never said no. And I, I think, you know, it, it, it's like, if you are part of the kind of bigger team of putting it together, which I think is how we're all gonna have to behave after this. Um, you know, if you know someone who knows how to do it really well, just ask for a favor and then understand that that'll come back to you. Like it, it I, I, I don't feel like you, everyone, as composers, Tamar said this before, it's like we spend so much time alone, right? And we forget that we can be part of this bigger community of people who actually are really willing to help each other out. And with film, I think especially because it does feel like, you know, one, like either you get the job or you don't, but that's like, we have to kind of not think about it as such fierce competition and more as kind of, I mean, tomorrow, you, I mean, you know, it's like, I, they, I was also in the running for, for Shirley. They, you know, they, they, they were like, they were like, this is gonna be awkward because she had the studio next to me. They were like, this is gonna be awkward. We're actually, <laughs> we're actually going to 1B. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, wow. Um, Nico <laughs> could tell. Friends. <laughs> I, I, that's Nico's story to tell because I, I love Nico too much. I wouldn't put that, you know, like I just, you know, but I was really grateful great. to have space. But you know, I mean, I was grateful to be sharing that space with you. It was very, it was, it was very inspirational. And the, the composers that I'm drawn to, it's for their work, but also their personhood. So yeah. I think that when you frame relationships from a place like that, then you don't have that intimidation. Like, you know, I, I look to Nico and his experience and, you know, feel like if I had an issue, I could easily ask. And, you know, certainly if he needed something on a demo, I, you know, it wouldn't even be a question, you know. Well, yeah, we've we, got a question we, here. We've, we've got a question here in the chat, which actually relates to this, which is um, for both of you, because you both work, you, you both write concert music as well as other kinds of music. Does your experience and skills as a concert music composer help with your film composing process and networking? Well, I would like to say that I think that's why I'm drawn to Nico's music because when you're listening to a score by Nico Muley, it doesn't sound like a generic film score. It has all this soul and presence because he is a composer across the board and he writes in different contexts. So he's bringing this full breadth of his ability as, as you know, an artist, his full breadth of his expression to his work. And I'm drawn to people who have unique voices as composers, period, as opposed to a media composer or film composer um, style. Because unfortunately, a lot of people are developing a style or a career around the whole temp culture, which is recreating what already exists. Whereas when you're dealing with a composer who is composing for ballet, for film, for concert, they're really drawing from their life experiences. They're drawing from their arsenal as a unique individual artist. And, and the, 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 the feeling is mutual. I and mean, I think that's, I think the reason that your film scores are so excellent is because everything you do is excellent. And it's not just that. And, and they go, they, they feed it. I mean, to answer the question a little bit better. And I think we, we can, they feed into one another in a way that is, almost 100% helpful. And the only way in which it's not helpful, I think, and tomorrow I, I, I assume you'll agree, is that you know when you're making your own thing, 
you're in a three-dimensional system in your own like heart and mind and craft and skill and whatever. And then when you're in a film, you know, you're not on, you're honestly not actually driving the car. So you 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 are taking everything you learned. I, I always use the metaphor, it's like, it's sort of like um it's a sprint doing a film, right? Because compared to if someone, if like tomorrow, if someone said like write us a string quartet, it'll premiere in 2022, you know, it's like 12 minutes and you have two years to write it, right? That's like an opera is, you know, two hours and four years to write it. Whereas a TV mm -hmm. show could be could be two hours of music and you have, you know, and it's due like on Wednesday. And so everything that you know as a musician, everything has to, you, you have to like get all that stuff out of the closet and just go. And so the more that you have as a, 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 a craftswoman, the more that you have as someone who can be in a band, the more you have as a theatrical uh, presence, the more of you have, the more of you that's present in what you make, um, the easier and randomly more fun it will feel, more like sports to, to do a film <laughs> like this, than something really stressful. Brilliant. I'm going to start whizzing through these questions because we've got lots of interesting questions here. So Ellie asks, and I'm going to ask this to Erin, besides composition, what do you think is the most important skill to have when working with film music? Oh, there's, there's quite a few things that have nothing to do with your ability to write music. Uh, one is to be somebody people want to be around, you know, be, be like have a positive energy. Um, don't, be you know grumpy in the studio and everybody else is stressed out um, and to be useful you know if you're if you're not the main composer your job is to be supportive and if they need you know coffee go get coffee even if that's not your job you know it's just to be useful in some sense of the word um, also uh, people like to work with interesting people you know if you're just kind of you know, you don't have a lot of other interests, you know, you might not be as exciting to work with, you know, to some film director as somebody who has a really compelling story. Um, and um, a lot of people come into the industry depending, thinking that you need to depend on an agent. And, you know, agents are great when you get them, but it's, it's a tough thing, you know, to get noticed by an agent. Um, and I always recommend to people that you just just score whatever you can and, you know, they'll find you. Erin, can I add something to that too, which is sure. it, also make friends with everybody and do not hierarchize anything, any interaction right. you have. You never know. I mean, you literally know, like the, like the person who's yeah. like someone's 87th assistant or something is going to end up running the entirety of the, of the, like the, the screen. <laughs> like, right. and, and, and the person who is like, and, and for me also specifically with, with music, if you're in any situation where there's an editor, whether or not it's a music editor or music supervisor or an editor, like someone who cuts film, that's how your music will get into someone's temp is, is like if an editor likes you, like if you, if you treat an editor like a human being and you yourself behave like a mammal and use your words, <laughs> like ch chances are higher that they'll be like, oh, I remember. And then just drop something in. It really, it really does sometimes take that. And I, I feel like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say don't be on the hustle, but understand right. that, that we're all in this together and that everyone is on a different kind of trajectory and that it's like, it, it mm -hmm. definitely is the case. I think that the, that the people who I, who I've met who are, who are really killing it, remember what it's like to have been not even getting coffee, getting like coffee grounds to get coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, and, and yeah, and, and to remember also that, that it's not just the music department that matters. It really is editors and it really is the people who, you know, the people who are like the, the script editor who turn into showrunners later. It's like every, again, everyone's on their own little rubber band towards the next place. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Interesting. I mean, I, my Go on, Tamar. Say again. Carry on. I think that my mantra has been, the work is the way. And I find that when I am focused and my intention is on the work and creating the work, that it's the safest place for me to exist. Because if I start thinking about ancillary things or get caught up in ego or anything like that, I'm, I'm a stumble. Like, that's pretty guaranteed. So I really try to 
maintain my focus on the priority, which is the work to, mm -hmm. to be able to collaborate with my collaborators with integrity, with authenticity and to create work. And I think, I, I know for a fact with my experience that when I'm focused there, that things flow, you know? And Tamar, I'm going to follow up because there's another question here in the in the chat, which is more of a kind of artistic question. I think I want to ask you because you talked about scoring um, the John Lewis documentary. So it says, when scoring a documentary, how concerned are you about editorializing too much, driving the narrative as opposed to supporting the story as journalistically pure as possible? How do you gauge those qualities? So for me, I did not have a traditional um, trajectory into film scoring. So that sounds very much like um, a conversation that might happen at university or conservatory when learning how to score to film. And so it was, it really, it, it, did, it just was not a factor for me I was working with the director we had I had an amazing music editor by the way um Susanna Perrick who is great with communicating and kind of being that connective tissue between the director and the composer so um you know she was an ace for sure and um so and I'm my style of writing is not demonstrative I don't point or direct ever um so for this I know that I did think to myself, I wanted to step out of the way because whatever the music was going to be, it needed to have a gentle presence that really just accompanied the viewer through his amazing journey. Like the story of his life, what he's gone through is quite dramatic. And so I knew that the music needed to bear witness as opposed to um, almost as if, you know, I was literally bearing witness as it happened, as opposed to thinking about someone who was telling the story later on. So I, I just really focused on being present. I didn't, uh, there was never a moment where I was concerned about editorializing. Um, I had an emotional connection. I also had a, a cultural connection. And um, I really went from there, of like how I wanted to bear witness and honor this person and that there needed to be, um, the music needed to reflect his gentle way um, as a as a pacifist and an, a nonviolent activist. Thanks so much, Tamar. Um, I'm going to start wrapping up because we're coming to the end. Um, one question I'd like to ask to Erin is about real change, and it's how do we envision the grants' um, effectiveness when women BIPOC composers have to struggle through? the hierarchical barriers, even to secure the hypothetical project that would merit that kind of funding in the first place. So I suppose it goes back a bit to Tamar Kali's point about the structural problems, which are obviously enormous, and, and, and what we can do with these um, grants that we're giving that would actually have an impact. Yeah, I think Tamar Kali had a really important point in addressing the structural problems, and that's, you know, I don't know if I have the solution to that. Um, I think as different voices go up the, you know, up the chain and become, you know, the heads of studios and, you know, people who are decision makers, um, maybe that will instigate some structural change. It's just, that's a really, that's a hard question. Yeah, I can join you um, on answering that too. So for me, what's really important about real change is not just giving um, financial support to what will be a relatively small number of people. It's about raising awareness of the issue and it's about inspiring other big players, as you were just kind of saying, Erin, to get involved who are actually in positions of power in the industry. So we have been approached already by some pretty important um, parts of the new film industry who are really interested in what we're doing and want to work out how they can work with us. And I think what we'll be doing is trying to get them to work more on the structural sides of, of things whilst we focus on how we can support artists, because that's obviously in our remit at New Music USA, and it's what the composer Christoph Beck wanted to do with, with, with the money that Christoph and CSAC are bringing to this. So 
think that's one other way to answer that question. Um, I think what we should do now, I'm just checking to see if there are any other ones coming through. I did see one earlier on which popped up, which said, how do you de-stress when you're in the middle of one of those moments, as you described, Nico? Do you have any secrets on how you de-stress? <laughs> I mean, I do two things. Um, I write a lot of emails that I don't send. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a whole coffee table book. <laughs> um, number, number one. Number two, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny, Aaron, Aaron, what you were saying is like, you know, I try, I try to back up into other things that I'm interested in doing. And especially, you know, one of the things about running for film is that you're listening to and hearing the thing all the time and you're watching the same two seconds of footage. I don't know how editors do it, by the way, um, is to do something that is the that is the least visual or least um, sonic thing you can possibly do. In my case, it's just cooking something really elaborate and it just gets me out of, gets me out of, you know, wor worrying about that stuff. But, but it's also, you know, once upon a time, um, you know, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, we could like go to a concert or the ballet or like a museum or to someone's house for dinner. Or you could like, it, it, you, you could sort of construct an evening of doing anything. And that was always what was so, I mean, Tamara, you remember when we, when we shared that studio space, right? It's like, it would be 6 p.m. And you knew that someone was ordering food and having a glass of white wine somewhere in that building. <laughs> but it wasn't me. Cause yeah, you know, everything you're talking about sounds Fabulous. I'm just too darn neurotic. 13 years of Catholic school has me absolutely perched. Um, I do I do busy work to break the monotony so that I can come back. Like I literally still work, but I'll do busy work. Like I'll catalog files, I'll bounce stems, I'll, you know, organize my cue list. It's terrible because it's like I, you know, I need to feel like I'm still working on the project, but I need to have a moment so that I can like, you know, and then maybe if it's lunch break, take a walk. But if you're talking about it there, Nico, right there. <laughs> if, it, if it helps, almost every composer I know is in therapy and on anti-anxiety medication. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> Dr. Rosenfeld, Dr. Rosenfeld stays in beta. <laughs> <laughs> So on that note, we're going to wrap up. I just want to ask Erin a quick question because obviously the right. elephant in the room here is that we are still in the middle of the global pandemic, although yeah. there are signs of hope ahead. Um, what's your reading at the moment of the landscape for film production and, and the return of the industry to how it was before? Oh, uh, well, I don't know how things are going to ever get back to what was normal before because um, I think a lot more people are going to be working from home for one. I don't think much has changed for media composers, at least, because they're still holed up in the cave, you know, by themselves. So that never, that, that, that they're fine, you know. Um, and I know that production is slowly starting to um, ramp up again, especially in areas that aren't as affected as uh, places like Los Angeles. I know that Vancouver is up and running um, and some other places around the country. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how things how things work, you know. And um, I, I hope we're not in for a whole slate of COVID-related programming because <laughs> I think everybody's had enough. But um, but yeah, it, things are starting to get back to um, you know somewhat how they were before. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm just going to pick up one other comment in the chat here, which says New Music USA ought to create a filmmaker composer opportunity for three to six composers each year. So I think that must be meaning bringing those two sides together, which is a nice idea. Um, I know programs that have brought composers and choreographers together in that way too. So yeah, we can think about that. And otherwise, I'd just like to, like to say huge thanks to our panelists, Nico Muli, Tamar Kali, and Erin Collins. Thank you so much. Um, thank, you. thank you to New York Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and Shira Gans, who you saw thank earlier, you. for making this happen. Um, and I also just want to let you all know that we're going to be putting on another panel as part of the Extended Play series on April the 22nd. Um, this time it's going to be about orchestral music and how we can support and promote symphonic music that better reflects the diverse communities of New York City. Um, and uh, please 
get on our website, it's newmusicusa.org and sign up to that if you're free. And there's lots of information about how to apply to Real Change as well. So Real Change is a rolling deadline. There's, you can come to us at any point in the year as long as you already have a film that you've been signed up to as a composer. And it's Manisha from our team at New Music USA who is working on that. So we hope to hear from some of you. And in the meantime, thank you all for attending and have a really great evening. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.